From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Elon Musk backs out of his agreement to buy Twitter, and much litigation will ensue. What does it mean for the social media site and the debate in the United States over tech companies and free speech? Plus some reflections on the legacy of Shinzo Abe, the former Japanese prime minister and great friend of the United States, who was assassinated on Friday. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo here with my Wall Street Journal colleagues, Joe Sternberg and Kim Strassel. Welcome to you both. Let's talk first about Elon Musk and Twitter, a business story in one sense, but also a political story in another. The entrepreneur had pitched $54 a share for the social media company at a $44 billion purchase price overall. And this is for a company that's lost $1.3 billion in total over the last two years. That's more than most companies these days who want to stay in business and have a share price and valuation as high as Twitter. So it's no surprise after the Musk announcement was made that Twitter shares are way down, trading at closer to 33 bucks a share on Monday morning. Both sides are going to sue each other fairly well. Kim, my own view is that Twitter's going to miss Elon Musk more than Musk will miss Twitter. And I say that because so Musk faces a $1 billion breakup fee for walking away from the deal. Twitter's going to find it very hard to replace Musk if they can't patch it up and put together a deal at a lower price, given the fact that it's been so unprofitable. It's been shedding users and nobody knows quite what's going to happen on the regulation front if Republicans take Capitol Hill this November. Musk's argument for breaking away was Twitter has too many spam accounts and there's a lack of transparency. Kim, you buying that Musk explanation? Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, as you just pointed out. And by the way, this has to be one of the strangest takeover situations of all time that I can ever remember in that here's a guy that everyone said couldn't buy Twitter. He couldn't figure out how to do it. And then Twitter didn't want him to. Now he actually made the bid and is pulling out and now they're going to try to force him to do it. We've had some very smaller companies where this has happened, but never something at this level. So the court battle here is going to be fascinating. But obviously what happened here is just that Twitter was always a questionable financial payoff for Musk anyway. He seemed to be going into this much more out of ideological grounds that he was interested in the free speech aspects of Twitter. There was a lot of warnings about Twitter and its financial situation and whether or not this was a good idea. Now, since then, we've had a worsening of this on all sides. We have new inflationary threats. Tesla, which is Musk's company, which accounts for an enormous amount of his personal wealth, which was crucial to this deal. It has been falling in the stock market as well, given some uncertainties and problems for that company. So he's now making this argument, as you say, that Twitter has not been open enough about the number of spam bots it has. He also argued that Twitter has been engaged engaging in hiring freezes and layoffs that he was not able to take part in, that these were critical decisions that they were making without him. That could be really hard to defend against in court, in part because a lot of tech companies have been engaging in hiring freezes given the current economic climate. There is some argument that maybe what Musk is trying to do here is to use a court battle to force Twitter to actually be honest or give more data or information about spam bots and what advertisers are really getting for what they pay for. But it's just really unclear where all this goes from a legal front. It's going to be fun to watch. This is one of those times when you really want to be a mergers and acquisitions lawyer because they are going to cash in probably at $1,500 an hour, if not more, on this one. And their ships have come in. Let's listen to Donald Trump, who has, of course, has opinion about everything, and he has an opinion about this that he issued on the weekend. Elon is not going to buy Twitter. Where did you hear that before? From me. From a fake account. She says fake. A lot of them. Nah, he's got himself a mess. You know, he said the other day, oh, I've never voted for a Republican. I said, I didn't know that. He told me he voted for me. So he's another bull artist, but he's not going to be buying it. He's not going to be buying it. 
Although he might later, who the hell knows what's going to happen. He's got a pretty rotten contract. I looked at his contract, not a good contract. Well, Joe, not a good contract. I guess if you're talking about bad contracts, Donald Trump would know. He's got a history of them. Yes, he does. Let's talk a little bit about the implications for Musk walking away from Twitter for free speech and debate because, um, of course, Trump famously banned from Twitter after January 6th, 2021. And he's now started up this Truth Social Network, which has become his uh, most frequent outlet for speaking apart from those events he offers. Where's Twitter going to go from here in terms of its censorship? The problem with this is that we've been hoping that Musk's purchase of Twitter was going to ease up some of the pressure on the, you know, what is perceived as censorship on the platform. And bear in mind that part of the problem here, and I think a big part of the complaint from conservatives and others about censorship on Twitter, is not just the suggestion that it happens, but also the opacity of it, the fact that there isn't really any clarity about exactly what the rules are, so you never know if you're going to run afoul of them. It's not clear how you can appeal any ruling that goes against you if they do want to shut down your account. Um, and so I think that there had been a real hope that new ownership and new management was going to solve some of those problems. I think this, though, comes back to this very interesting business question that this transaction has raised, which is what is the company actually worth? And I think that it's difficult to separate out some of these political or censorship concerns from that, because really a big part of Musk's business rationale for this deal would have been that Twitter is an underperforming asset as long as it is not serving as a viable platform for free speech. And that's a very interesting argument, because I think kind of the political logic for you know certain Republicans on Capitol Hill who want to regulate these social media entities more heavily is that you have to have the regulation because otherwise there's not going to be any incentive for them to clean up their act. You know, if Musk were to find some way to pursue this deal, it would be kind of the opposite argument that actually the market will discipline companies more in favor of free speech because doing that will be in their commercial best interest. Well, as we speak, the market cap of Twitter is $25.67 billion, Kim, which is more than I can afford. <laughs> and, you know, we'll see if there's another buyer that can approach it. But that strikes me as a pretty rich valuation right there. Now it's down considerably from pre-Musk offer dollars and valuation even then. I think part of the problem here with Twitter and censorship, Kim, is, is it all seems to be one-sided. You always frequently read about these cases of conservatives or non-conservatives who just have idiosyncratic views about subjects like climate or um, COVID, have floating alternative ideas from the Centers for Disease Control on COVID treatments or the uh, effectiveness of vaccines. Alex Berenson, the uh, former New York Times reporter who has been a crusader for alternative views views about COVID all along was banned for months. Now he's back on. But in many ways, uh, the critics of the conventional wisdom on COVID have been uh, vindicated. And you want those ideas to be out and debated. You don't want them shut down. Yeah. By the way, Alex is back on, but only after a litigation that he engaged in. And I think that's an important point is that because he had a bit of a platform and some backing, he was able to negotiate a settlement, as it were, and get back on to Twitter. But not everybody has that ability. And you want all those different voices out there. As we know, just from COVID, and as you said, a lot of the perceived wisdom that was all that was allowed is now proving to be not true. And that a lot of the people who were poking at the edges and pushing back had some really valid points. And that goes across the board. We're seeing that. Look at all the army of fact checkers out there that also exist on many of these social media sites to even go after newspapers like ours if they believe that there are some opinions that do not conform with their current thinking of the world. One other thing that I would throw in here as well, too, which is the, the great unknown, and it was even an unknown as Musk was going to take over this company, which is the political element of this, which a lot of this censorship, and you noted that it's one way, it's come because there's a lot of pressure from Washington right now, a Washington that is run by Democrats for social media companies to conform with Democratic reigning ideology and their argument for what counts as disinformation or not. And 
these giant media companies, which have a lot of different business ventures, all of which are sensitive to different regulators in Washington, that clearly is playing in as well, too, to some of this censorship that's going on. And by the way, I should note that the pressure also comes from conservatives as well, although they certainly haven't been as influential in getting these companies to do what they'd like them to do. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, maybe a little more on Twitter and then Shinzo Abe and Japan, his legacy see and what it means for American interests when we come back. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Jugo here with Joe Sternberg and Kim Strassel. And Joe, just one final point on Twitter and Elon Musk. If the deal breaks up with Musk and Twitter, which I assume it will unless Twitter is willing to accept a considerably smaller offer. There'll be some kind of a settlement. Elon Musk will pay something. But for Twitter, they not only have the market risk, they're going to have regulatory risk. And that's particularly true if Republicans take Congress because there's all these promises now being made by Republican congressional leaders. It says, we're going to do something about social media sites and free speech. Now, that is a fraught road to travel because of the First Amendment. And because of Section 230 in law, which allows these sites to censor content free from liability. But if they continue to be unhappy about that, uh, there could be some uh, law that passes. I don't know if Joe Biden would sign it, but uh, the Republicans are really intent on doing something. Yes. And that's why I think that certainly for all of the palaver when this uh, bid was announced about, you know, Twitter trying to resist it and, you know, people being fretful about uh, Musk coming in and trying to change the corporate culture there in ways that would have diminished the influence of some of the censorship that's going on. If this deal really does fall apart, I think that they're probably going to come to regret that very quickly because this was their opportunity to adopt a market-based solution to the controversy over censorship on some of these platforms. Platforms. And it was their opportunity to say that actually these companies in Silicon Valley are capable of heeding these market incentives in favor of freer speech that gives a platform to the half of the country that votes conservative and holds those views. If they lose that opportunity, Congress is in danger of doing it for them. And it's going to be very messy. And I think that a lot of people, including on the right, might not like where that process ends up. But the temptation for the politicians might become irresistible if there is no evidence that the companies are prepared to tackle these problems in good faith themselves. All right, let's turn to the assassination of Shinzo Abe, the former Japanese prime minister significant prime minister, longest serving in Japan's post-war history, killed in Nara, the ancient capital, as he campaigned, killed by a uh, a young assailant whose motives are still uh, not clear to me. It seems he was upset about Abe's relationship to some religious party. Uh, We'll find out more about that. Though Abe was out of power, his legacy is significant, and we want to talk about that. But one immediate consequence of the assassination seems to be that in the election for a Japanese upper house of its uh, parliament, Abe's party, the Liberal Democratic Party, gained seats with the Kameto party, the junior partner in that center-right coalition. It is now close to a two-thirds majority. It needs to change the post-war pacifist constitution. We want to talk about that, but uh, what's the legacy of Shinzo Abe? It's an immense legacy. He was the longest serving post war prime minister in a country that typically has been marked by a very large number of prime ministers over the years who tended to serve relatively short terms. So he had served once for a brief term himself in 2006 and 2007, about a year. But he came back into power in late 2012 and then was in office for eight years until 2020. And you know, he came in on this promise of revitalizing Japan and really of turning it into a normal country again. And so the two parts of that were economic revitalization when the country at that point was in the middle of losing a second or third decade after the bubble had collapsed in the late 80s. And that economic revitalization was going to be in service of sort of a strategic revitalization or a new way of Japan thinking about its role in its neighborhood and in the world. 
Um, you know, this conversation about the pacifist constitution had to do with his desire to push through an amendment that would have made it possible for the Japanese military to participate alongside Japanese allies like the U.S. in military endeavors in the region and potentially around the world. That seems likely to happen now with this election result. But I think that that was part of a broader attempt to rejuvenate Japan's relationship with America, to build alliances with you know other democratic partners like India and Australia, all because of an awareness of the rising threat that China poses in the region and a recognition that democracies would need to act to counter that. And I should add, Joe covered Japan from his base in Hong Kong for years, so he knows whereof he speaks. Kim, from my vantage point uh, here, I think Japan is arguably America's most significant ally now. You could argue that Britain has been. Certainly, it's the closest culturally to us and very significant, sharing some of the same values. But when it comes to the rise of China, the Japanese-U.S. relationship is enormously significant. And Abe had the foresight not only to understand that Japan and the United States needed to be close, which they've been since World War II, but that Japan had to become more than just a secondary partner, that it needed to step up and spend more militarily. They've broken through thanks to his efforts spending 1% of GDP on defense spending. They may end up changing that constitution. In a society that is so based on consensus and slow evolutionary political progress, Abe pushing that over the years is enormously significant. Yes, and it goes to show what an important leader he was. You know, to give an example of that relationship that he managed to reforge with the United States, we were talking about the efforts that have been ongoing to change the pacifist constitution in Japan, which is Article 9. And for a long time, the interpretation was that it prevented Japan from going to war or maintaining any form of armed forces. And thanks to Abe's pushing, there was a reinterpretation to allow defensive forces. And that paved the way for the U.S.-Japan defensive guidelines in 2015, which greatly expanded the ability for Japan to militarily support the U.S. And that gets to your point, Paul, as it was a strategic replacing of Japan's role with the United States so that it was more of an actual partner. And at this crucial time, as China was really rising as a threat. The one other thing I would note, too, that was equally important that Abe did is as you had China rising as that threat, he really served for all of his years in office and even following as this counterbalance to China's communist and authoritarian model, constantly speaking to other countries in the region, reminding them that there was an alternative, a free market, free people alternative, and really challenging China with some other things, investing some money, for instance, in the region of infrastructure as an alternative to China's Belt and Road approach. So that was really important as well, just China serving as that kind of U.S. partner in outpost in the region as things have shifted dramatically. Matt Pottinger, the former deputy NSC advisor under Donald Trump, writing in our pages on Monday that uh, Shinzo Abe actually came up with the concept of the Indo-Pacific, which has now been uh, institutionalized in the so-called Quad, a group of uh, four nations, U.S., Japan, India, Australia, and is now a common discussion point that Biden and Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State under Biden, have both expanded. And now there are regular, there are annual meetings of the four heads of state, the so-called Quad. China dislikes that uh, formulation because it uh, includes India and Southeast Asia and doesn't make China the center of the Asia-Pacific universe as it very much wants to be. And I think that's another legacy of Abe. And I think, Joe, for some Americans who can remember when Japan was rising economically, post-war era, and a lot of fretting in the United States about Japan becoming number one, remember the famous book 
Ezra Vogel, Japan as number one. Of course, that never transpired for a variety of reasons we won't go into here. But my own view is that of a economically dynamic Japan, a, uh, a much more uh, confident Japan internationally is very much in the United States national interest. Absolutely. And I think that uh, there were a couple things that were going on there. One of them is the fact that, I mean, although Japan never did become the world's number one largest economy surpassing the U.S. for a long time was number two, and even now remains number three behind the U.S. and China. So we're talking about a substantial economy with a very high-tech manufacturing base, a very high-productivity manufacturing economy, and also understand that it's not just the Japanese economy within Japan. If you travel around regions, particularly strategically important areas like Southeast Asia, you are going to find evidence of Japanese investment, of trade and business ties all over countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand. You know, the Japanese companies had really created a footprint print across the region. And so I think that that is something that really transformed Japan into a, a strategic player, partly having the economic heft to pay for the responsibilities that come with that kind of role, but also this growing awareness that precisely because they were so economically entwined with the rest of their region and with the U.S., that they had to take actions on the security or defense front to protect their national interests. So I think that that has been a big part of the Japan story that Abe really seized on. And I mean, remember the period when he was really first finding his feet in the first couple of years of his second administration was also a period when I remember you would have a lot of trade tensions between Japan and China over Japanese access to Chinese rare earth minerals that were so important for Japan's high-tech economy. And so I think that kind of episode really reinforced in Tokyo the need to get serious about that kind of security issue. And they were very fortunate to have in Shinzo Abe a, a leader at hand who was prepared to think about that kind of thing and also prepared to lead on that kind of question. All right. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Kim. Another great opening to another eventful week. Congress is back in town, unfortunately, so we'll have to deal with them here as the week moves forward. <laughs> Let's hope they don't do too much damage to the American economy. Thank you both, and please send in your comments to us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. Questions also welcome. We're here every day, so please check in tomorrow on Potomac Watch.